Hello and welcome to the Dizziness and Balance video series by the Ear and Balance Institute. I am your host, Dr. Jerry Gianoli, and I am a board-certified neurootologist. Neurootology is the medical specialty that deals with inner ear dizziness and balance disorders. This video series is intended to be educational and not intended to be medical advice. For individual medical advice, please speak with your own physician. Well, welcome back. This is part two for third mobile window syndrome video. If you haven't seen part one, I'd suggest you go back and uh, review that before coming to this video. But remember from part one, a syndrome is symptoms, a collection of symptoms seen together. So third mobile window syndrome encompasses a number of different disorders, the most common being superior semicircular canal dehiscence, but there's a number of others as well. The diagnosis is dependent on number one, the history and symptoms, number two, objective testing, and number three, imaging findings. Well, as far as treatment goes, we first identify uh, the, what the symptoms the patient has. There are certain symptoms, well, first of all, as we mentioned in, in video one, not all patients with third mobile window syndrome have any symptoms. And if we have a patient, for example, that has superior canal dehiscence and they have no symptoms, well, that patient really doesn't require any treatment beyond counseling and letting them know what their disorder is and what's the potential future issues they can see, that sort of thing, but no active treatment per se. Um, then we talk about other symptoms. There are some symptoms that are very amenable to treatment and some that are not. And one in particular is the high-pitched tinnitus. Uh, I'm, I regret to inform several patients that it, that is one symptom we very rarely see uh, any significant improvement with such that if that's the only symptom they have, we generally don't uh, engage in any sort of treatment for that. Well, the next step in someone with third mobile window syndrome is uh, look for the total problem. Some of these folks will have more than one dehiscence. In fact, up to 20% of patients with a dehiscence one place in their inner ear, and when I say dehiscence, I mean a hole in the bone of their inner ear, 20% will have more than one hole. They may have a hole or a defect somewhere else. Some of these patients will have loss of balance function, typically just one side, but so every once in a while we come across someone who's lost significant amount of balance function in both sides. And those patients have to be treated very differently than someone who's got good vestibular function. There are other associated problems you can see, and the, probably the most common is associated benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is the loose crystal problem in the inner ear. And again, we have uh, another couple of videos geared toward uh, talking about BPPV. So if you haven't seen that, uh, go ahead and look at those videos as well. When it comes to third mobile window syndrome, the treatment uh, there are basically three routes. There's non-medical treatment, there's medical treatment, and then there's surgical treatment. Non-medical treatment is the following. Uh, first of all, one of the th hallmarks of third mobile window syndrome is strain-induced vertigo and dizziness. So basically bearing down hard, blowing your nose hard will induce vertigo. So this is what I refer to as Groucho Marx medicine. Um, if for you guys old enough, you may remember Groucho Marx. And he, was, he had a famous scene where he, he's a comedian from the 1930s and had a famous scene where he dressed up as a doctor. And a patient comes in to him and says, Doc, it hurts when I do this. And Groucho Marx says, well, don't do that. And that's exactly what we recommend for the, no, for the strain-induced vertigo and dizziness. We tell the patients, do not strain, at least for initially after the onset of treatment. And that, in, in and of itself, can make a, a huge um, uh, improvement in the vertigo and dizziness for patients with third mobile window syndrome. We then also recommend a diet, uh, avoidance of salt and caffeine, which will reduce pressure waves going to the head and through the defects to their inner ear that can provoke problems. We also recommend that they look at a migraine diet because some folks 
will have migraine uh, uh, s- uh, disorders associated with certain food items, such as hypoglycemia, red wines, cheeses, that sort of stuff. And for those folks, being on a migraine diet is often helpful. Next is we have them avoid uh, abnormal pressure situations. For example, if they are uh, prone to pain in their ears when they fly on airplanes, the reason they get pain in their ears is because of eustachian tube dysfunction. And this is actually a common problem. Roughly about a third of the American public have some eustachian tube troubles when they fly. They'll get pain in their ears when the plane descends. For most people, it's, it's simply just discomfort in the ears. But if you also happen to be one of those folks with a third mobile window syndrome and you've got this eustachian tube dysfunction, it can cause major problems with vertigo, dizziness, hearing loss, et cetera. So for those folks who have that problem, we have them avoid air travel, pressure altering events such as that. And if they have to fly, they can get, uh, there's some ways of getting around it. There's uh, uh, decongestants to kind of help open up the eustachian tube. Uh, you, there's a product called earplanes that's been used to help with that. And in the worst case scenarios, we can do a myringotomy or put a tube in the eardrum. It's basically making a hole in the ear canal, I mean, excuse me, the eardrum to allow air to pass through to the middle ear and prevent that pressure altering event. For the patients who have sound induced problems, which is very common among patients with third mobile window syndrome, we recommend noise canceling headphones. Um, Many patients have kind of identified this on their own and have used them to alleviate a lot of the symptoms of third mobile window syndrome. What they don't know is that if you just use earplugs, it's not as effective as active noise cancellation. The reason for that is because earplugs block out mainly high frequency sound, as in above 1000 hertz. The problem is most dizziness balance problems are caused by sound waves below 1000 hertz. And for that, you need the active noise cancellation. And what noise canceling headphones do is they have a microphone on the side of the uh, earplug or ear muff and it, it collects the sound and then it emits a sound into your ear that's the, ac- the opposite phase of the low frequency sound coming in and cancels it. So without that active noise cancellation, the low frequency sound is still gonna be a problem if you just wear earplugs. The last is um, micro prism lenses. And by that is, this is something a neuro optometrist uh, would give the patient. For patients that have third mobile window syndrome, they have asymmetric input from their utricle, which is one of the gravity sensors, and that can cause a misalignment of the eyes and cause some visual uh, focusing problems and some associated symptoms with that that can range from headaches to neck pain and things like that. What the micro prism lenses do is it gives the patient a prism so that the eye will normally catch the, um, the, the correct vision and, and, and prevent the visual difficulties and improve the visual acuity. Um, second is medical therapy. And the first uh, is to control any medical problem that will cause an increase in the intracranial pressure. And there's a number of those that can do that. Uh, Hypothyroidism is one of them. Uh, But probably the one that gets, uh, kind of flies under the radar a bit is obstructive sleep apnea. When you go to sleep at night, if you stop breathing, uh, you, you have what we call apnea. And the oxygen level will go down, carbon dioxide level will go up, and the pressure in the head will go up quite significantly. And the more this happens, the more the pressure will go up and will cause problems with someone who has a third mobile window syndrome. So treating that can go a long way into helping these folks. The second is diuretics. Uh, Diuretics, as a lot of people know, are just a fluid pill. It helps you, it makes you urinate more. And what that does is because it gets fluid out of your body, it also lowers the pressure in your head and hence the pressure on the ear and helps with third mobile window syndrome. 
the the other medication actually I like better than the diuretics is something called the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. That's a class of medications. The, the most commonly used one is called diamox or acetazolamide. They lower the pressure in the head by reducing the production of cerebrospinal fluid. And the reason I like these better is because they're much more powerful at lowering that pressure, and it seems like you can get a lot more done with those. Now, the downside is they also have more side effects uh, than the diuretics. And if someone responds to the diuretics, in a lot of ways that's better because they, they don't have to deal with as many side effects. And then lastly, there are some symptoms that uh, patients with third mobile window syndrome will have that we can't correct with the medications that can be treated uh, symptomatically, such as nausea, anti-nausea medicines. Uh, as we mentioned, tinnitus and hearing loss, uh, hearing aids are, are really good for that. Lastly, for the patients who are inadequately treated or cannot tolerate the non-medical and medical therapies, these are the patients with the worst problems, their surgery. And the surgery is geared toward either fixing the defect in the inner ear, or what we call direct surgical repair, or reinforcing the middle ear windows, the rounds or oval windows. And both of these are helpful in improving the third mobile window syndrome. Unfortunately, the direct surgical repair is not something we can do for all of the third mobile window defects. They're really just the semicircular canal defects, such as the superior canal dehiscence, the posterior canal dehiscence, and the horizontal canal dehiscence. All the other ones we mentioned earlier are not really amenable to surgical repair. For those, pretty much the reinforcement of the windows is the way to go. And they're very good at helping the vertigo and dizziness. There are some other things to consider. Uh, for patients where, you, let's say you've got someone who's got a cochlear facial dehiscence and you can, all you can do is the reinforcement of windows, but they get a lot of pressure in their ears. Some of those patients can be helped by something called an endolymphatic sac decompression. This is a surgery that was originally developed for Meniere's disease, but it seems to help with acting as a pressure shunt for patients with third mobile window syndrome. Next is the ventilation tube or PE tube placement uh, that we talked about earlier. And that's really just for folks that have bad eustachian tube dysfunction along with third mobile window syndrome. If you've got normal eustachian tube uh, function, putting a tube in the ear is not going to help third mobile window syndrome. Lastly, uh, for patients who do have chronically elevated intracranial pressure that does not respond to medical therapy, those are patients that uh, a procedure directed toward lowering the intracranial pressure can significantly benefit these folks. And that's something I would refer to a neurosurgeon or, a, or an interventional neuroradiologist to do. Uh, there's basically kind of two procedures. One is you can do a shunt uh, directing spinal fluid from inside the brain to the belly or, or another place. Uh, the most common is to the belly. It's called a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. And there's also some vascular procedures where they go in and do stents to open up the, the veins to drain blood from the brain, which also improve the, um, the uh, pressure in the head. Well, when it comes to uh, symptom relief, uh, one thing that is, I think, a misconception to a lot of patients off the bat is not all of the symptoms that a patient with third mobile window syndrome will have will be relieved with treatment. There are certain treatments that help certain symptoms and other treatments that help other symptoms. In particular, the surgery is mainly beneficial. Its main benefit is with vertigo and dizziness. It also helps imbalance. It helps with that autophony, hearing your ear, your voice in your ear too loud or your joints, that sort of thing, as well as the pulsatile tinnitus of sort of hearing uh, your heartbeat in your ears. The other symptoms associated with third mobile window syndrome, they don't, it, the surgery doesn't seem to help quite as much. For example, the fullness and pressure in the ear I've found with patients, it generally doesn't help that symptom near as much. It, I wouldn't recommend it for the, the high-pitched tinnitus. 
uh, I wouldn't recommend it for hearing loss. So there are some folks with third mobile window syndrome that just have hearing loss, and I, I wouldn't recommend it for that. Medical therapy, uh, although it's got its limitations, does seem to help a lot of the auditory symptoms that we don't see as well helped with surgery. And in particular, the fullness and pressure in the ear is often helped with the medical therapy, the pulsatile tinnitus, the autophony, and to some degree, the vertigo, dizziness, and imbalance. So for a lot of my patients, especially if they have all these symptoms, sometimes they wind up getting a combination of those two therapies together. And again, usually not improved is the high-pitched tinnitus and hearing loss. But the good news for that, those are things that once the other symptoms are improved, that's amenable to other types of treatments such as using a hearing aid. So in, in conclusion, third mobile window syndrome uh, treatment, there's a variety of different ways of treating it. There's not one size fits all. And figuring out what's best for the individual patient uh, is based on what other individual circumstances, their symptoms, what kind of deficits they have in their inner ear, and how well they respond to different therapies. Thank you.